Welcome back to Cross Keys. I'm Steve Munson, the winemaker here. We're excited to, uh, to do another tasting of some of the wines that I, I think we're really show off our estate, um, what we grow best here at Cross Keys. Before we get started, uh, I'd like to say that once again, we are open. We have plenty of out outdoor seating. The beach is open as well, so wine and food. Um, we can now order uh, tastes and flights as well, uh, so we can get a wider variety of our wines. And we look forward to having you out here. It's been some beautiful weather. We have lots of umbrellas and lots of space to spread out outside. Uh, it's some really good food. So hopefully we see you uh, for this weekend and, and for time to come. Uh, another special thing that uh, we're doing, we talked about it uh, previously, was our cans. Uh, this is the weekend that, uh, this is why we put wine in cans. Fourth of July, going to the lake, uh, hanging out on your back porch with a cooler full of ice. This is the perfect time for our wine and cans. So we have our rosé, which we'll taste today, our Joy White, our most popular white wine, and well, a special concoction I made of a blood orange cardamom wine. So hopefully they are a great accompaniment to warm weather and uh, time outside. So hopefully you can enjoy some of those as well. But let's jump right into the tasting uh, and talk about these wines. Uh, I picked these wines specifically because uh, the Cabernet Franc and Petit Verdot are really the two red wines that express themselves best here on the property. Uh, and Cabernet Franc being a component of the Fiore as well. So this kind of shows you the variety of styles that we get out of our estate grown red fruit. Uh, right now, at uh, this time of year, uh, the canopies are full, so the, the shoots are fully grown, the clusters have all formed, the berries are still just about the size of a pea, maybe a little bit larger, the clusters are still kind of loose and they're hard green, but uh, before too long with this sunny weather, we're making sure we're pulling the leaves to get sun in and uh, onto that fruit. They're we'll starting changing colors and sweetening up and we're approaching harvest very rapidly. So uh, let's start here with the Fiore. Uh, Fiore means flower in Italian. Uh, it's our style of rosé, specifically made from Cabernet Franc and Chamberson. Uh, typically we say about a 50-50 ratio. Uh, Really what I'm looking for with Fiore, uh, when it comes to that ratio, is the chemistry of the fruit and of the juice that we make the wine out of. So if we need a little bit more acidity, typically Chamberson has some more acidity, so maybe the percentage of Chamberson will increase by 10 to 15%, um, you know, or if the acidity is too high in certain years, we'll use a little bit more Cabernet Franc. But generally it's 60-40, 50-50, either way, uh, really based on on chemistry. And what makes this wine special is that this is not a byproduct rosé. This is not a rosé that's made out of leftover red wine. Uh, the section of our vineyard that makes Fiore, we grow it to make Fiore. So the two blocks of Cab Franc here, uh, or the two types of Cab Franc here, come from the same block with rows that are dedicated to Fiore production. We leave more leaves on the vine to help uh, keep them sheltered from the sunlight, and that helps hold the acidity. Uh, they don't get quite as ripe, so the sugar's a little bit lower, so it'll have a little less alcohol, and it'll have more herbaceous uh, floral notes to it. It's not quite as fruity as uh, a lower crop yield, full sun exposure Cabernet Franc. So even within the same block, we'll designate the row specifically for Fiore production. Uh, the wine is picked by hand. The clusters go directly into our grape press. Uh, so it's a whole cluster press. We press it into juice, uh, settle it in the tank, and then ferment it and we'll usually ferment the Chamberson and Cap Franc together for the most part. Uh, we'll have a little bit of Chamberson, a little bit of Cap Franc Rosé fermenting separately that we can kind of fine tune the final blend as uh, the fermentation ends. And really what jumps out here is that nose. It's that great strawberry fruitiness that you get from Chamberson. Um, it really provides kind of that strength of jammy, you know, bright fruit that you get from the nose. But what makes it interesting, the reason we use the, the Cabernet Franc is that there's almost a boxwood herbaceous comp component to that nose as well, and that's what we get from the Cabernet Franc. And what you notice on the palate is that acidity was the focus for this wine. Um, it's very bright, it's very juicy. Uh, we balance it, tend to balance it with just a little bit of residual sugar at the end of fermentation as we try to find balance there. But what we look from that acidity 
is that mouth-watering quality, that really big juiciness, and it even makes it taste sweeter and fruitier than it actually is, just because it's so vibrant in the mouth. It's exciting, it's electric, uh, it can be uh, had at room temperature, like I'm having it now, and it has more of that herbal complexity, but you can also throw it on ice, uh, and it has enough juiciness, fruitiness, that uh, even ice cold, there's lots of flavors to explore. The other thing we do to try to keep this wine lively is uh, at the end of fermentation, which is the process of yeast turning sugar into alcohol, a byproduct of that is carbon dioxide, CO2, bubbles. Um, now this doesn't have like bubbles like a sparkling wine would, but CO2 does get dissolved in the wine as it's uh, fermenting. And you can drive that CO2 off by moving the wine or by sparging the wine with nitrogen. Uh, but we like to try to keep that CO2 as high as we can. There's some limitations when you bottle it, uh, you know, that it can't be too foamy. But if you notice that slight petulance, that's the, the French word for it, um, that little bit of carbonation there, uh, the carbonic acid, or CO2 in wine, helps add to that fruity and uh, fresher palate as well. It also adds a little bit of interest, and I think it makes the wine finish very, very cleanly. Uh, even uh, with all that flavor, all that acidity, and that, even that little bit of uh, residual sweetness to it, uh, it doesn't, it's not cloying. The wine finish is very, very clean, very linear, um, and just really refreshing. So, as we move up the hill in the Cabernet Franc block, you'll notice uh, this time of year you can actually see the difference in, in how we're growing the grapevines. Uh, typically, about halfway up the block is where we'll start for Cabernet Franc red wine production. And for that, we do a pretty aggressive shoot thinning. We want to make sure there's plenty of space in the canopy. Uh, we don't want leaves, shading leaves. We're really trying to avoid any sort of bushiness because uh, that helps cut down on vegetable flavors. Uh, also, towards the end of June, we'll remove all of the leaves uh, that are around the clusters. So there's about a foot of the canopy that has no leaves on it anymore. And we only we'll expose that on the morning side. That lets the sun in before it gets too intense and too hot. But that sun helps ripen those skins. It helps soften the tannins, helps get more fruit flavors and drive off herbaceousness. And it can also lower the acidity. So for us, it's about trying to find that balance of ripeness, acidity, and sugar as we ripen up the red wines. And a critical component of that is one of the saddest things in the winery, uh, or at the, wine, at the winery, towards the middle of August, uh, when the fruit has changed colors from green to, to purple, we'll actually go out into the vineyard and we'll cut every single cluster off that's pink. Uh, so it's still probably pretty good and we could probably make a rosé out of it, but we, we want those vines to concentrate all of their effort on ripening to the same grapes that are uniformly ripe. So we'll go out and we'll cut off either part of the cluster, an entire cluster, any cluster that was too high in the canopy and didn't get enough sunlight on it, uh, until we get a nice uniform purple, well exposed uh, fruit for, for making red wine out of. Uh, so we can, in certain cab franc blocks, we can drop you know, 40% of the fruit uh, in August uh, in order to try to get uh, the ripening for the remaining fruit. Caramel Franc is uh, hand-picked again. This time it's distemmed and those whole berries go into a tank. Uh, we'll do a combination of punch downs and pump overs, trying to extract the flavors that we worked so hard to build in those skins. Um, and fermentation can take anywhere between seven and 14 days. Uh, we can extend that fermentation out to 21 days and beyond. Typically, Cabernet Franc, we like to hit that part of fermentation, which is about six days when the wine is really fermenting sugar and alcohol aggressively and it's getting warm. Uh, that's when you can you know, think of it like tea. The hotter the liquid, the more extract you'll extract from the tea bag and also the more you dunk it. So kind of during that hot six-day period, with Cabernet Franc especially, we concentrate on punching down, mixing, essentially dunking that tea bag, making sure those grapes are always in contact with wine. So four times a day, these wines are getting mixed by hand uh, with a big metal rod. And we do that to try to draw those tannins uh, out of the skins. Uh, we like that shorter fermentation so we don't get as many tannins from the seeds, which tend to be a little harsher. Uh, but we want as much of that ripe skin in as we can get.
and what kind of what makes our red wine special too is that they go into the bottle unfined and unfiltered. So uh, this is, you know, comes out of the tank, we press it, age it in a barrel, and then just through a series of decanting clean wine off of any solids that are inside the barrels, that's how we clarify and prepare the wine for, for bottle. Um, so it never goes to a tight filter. It retains all of its, uh, you know, the, the complexes that, that give it its mouthfeel. Um, I'm not totally against filtration. Sometimes it's totally necessary, but we're, we've kind of found a nice balance of that kind of those rustic uh, textures, some of those more rustic aromatics that you get in this Cabernet Franc, but there's still that nice dark blackberry aroma and flavor that comes, uh, comes through. And the hallmark of the red wines we grow here is that pronounced acidity, but it's really well balanced with that extraction of tannins that we got. So these are ageable wines, wines that really can stand up to time, even though there's not a ton of tannins in the Cabernet Franc specifically, it's, it's actually relatively quite smooth, but there's just enough to bring that acidity into balance. And it makes it a very food friendly wine. Um, you know, it's definitely beefier than you would say to some table drinking wine, but it, it absolutely uh, is not one of those take the coating off your, off your inside of your mouth uh, wines. It's very well balanced. And then typically with uh, that oak aging, we won't exceed 30%, usually it's closer to 15 to 20% new French oak. So of the barrels that this wine goes into, uh, only 10 to 20% will actually be new oak, which has all the flavor. We don't want oak to be the flavor of this wine. We just want it to be an undercurrent, a complement to kind of that rustic fruit that we get from our Cabernet Franc. And then finally, we go across the road. All these wines kind of came from the exact same area. Um, a little, on a slightly different aspect of the hillside is our Petit Verdot. And Petit Verdot uh, has its own time scale, would be the best way to put it. Sometimes you think it's a problem child. Uh, because it doesn't look like the rest of the great wines, but essentially Petit Verdot is just kind of always behind. Uh, so it buds out last, um, it hits the top, you know, the canopy fills up last, the fruit changes color last, um, it's picked last, <laughs> and sometimes when we're aging it, it, it wants to be aged longer than everything else. So Petit Verdot kind of dictates the terms. Uh, but over the years, what we realized is that there's a lot of consistency in this block. Even in years where we were struggling to get ripeness in other blocks, if you just leave Petit Verdot alone, it'll get there. Uh, the key is just to, to let it do its thing. So it kind of is the boss and we have to build the, the wine around what Petit Verdot wants to be. But it's a, it's a wonderful asset that even in quote unquote bad years, Petit Verdot is going to be our Petit Verdot. It, it always performs exceptionally well, no matter what the vintage, uh, you know, weather or uh, anything like that. Um, it has very little impact on it. And a part of that is because the berries are so small uh, that they don't respond, they don't dilute very much when there's a lot of water. Um, and since they're so late, we don't have to worry about the too intense sunlight that holds its acidity really well. Uh, it's just kind of a bulletproof grape for us. And one thing we found though, is once again, uh, with cutting the green fruit off, Petit Verdot loves to give us way too much fruit. Um, and it, it's a direct correlation of how much fruit is in the vineyard to the aromatic intensity you get in the wine. Uh, we really, target uh, certain tons per acre on Petit Verdot to try to achieve the aromatics. And the aromatics you get here is that quintessential classic violet Petit Verdot. There's that floral component to it. This uh, Petit Verdot has got some great fruit behind it as well. It's almost like a, a dried fruit leather. It's, a, it's almost a drying sensation on the fruit. I don't want to call it necessarily jammy, uh, but there's that strong floral and then a little bit of cedar that you get from the, the oak. And whereas with the Cabernet Franc, we tried to nail that window of extraction and really get a lot of extraction done in six days. The key to Petit Verdot is to take your time. But it, like I said, it drives the bus. Um, you can over extract Petit Verdot, it can come, become way too bitter. There's a lot of tannins and the ratio of wine to berry is much lower because of the small berry size we get from Petit Verdot. So we focus with Petit Verdot a little bit more on a pump over for extraction. 
And that's when we take the wine out of the bottom of the tank, we splash it in the big bin, and then pump it back over the top, and that aerates and mixes uh, without the mechanical action actually breaking up those berries and getting too much of that uh, tannin. It also helps incorporate oxygen, which softens the tannins in the tank. Um, but like I said, uh, Petit Verdot rewards you for showing a little bit of restraint. Uh, because even this wine, which wouldn't, I would not call, uh, we didn't work to extract it nearly as hard as we do the Cabernet Franc, you can still taste those much rookier tannins. Uh, it's a much more firm wine. And then during barrel aging, Petit Verdot can match up to New Oak a lot more. I think between these two, they're both at about, in Cab Franc, at 23% New French Oak. Uh, this Petit Verdot is around closer to 30, 28%. Uh, so similar amounts, uh, but just like you don't even notice the oak at all in that Petit Verdot, it can really stand up to it. So uh, oak is definitely just there to kind of fill out the mid palate of those tannins so you don't have too many on the, on the back end. But it makes it, once again, uh, another wine that has great acidity, uh, that really helps lend itself to aging very well. It has a long, well, long life ahead of it. Uh, those tannins will continue to smooth. Eventually, you'll start getting more of those cedar notes out of the, the oak treatment uh, over time. But it's a vibrant wine when it's young, and it really does maintain that vibrancy as it ages. This is a wine that pairs, uh, you know, it's even better with food, you know, something that can help balance out some of the, the astringency you get with the wine. But that said, uh, you know, certain people, if you like your coffee black, uh, if you like espressos, the Petit Verdot is kind of that style of wine, something that has a little bit of that bitterness to it. Um, but like I said, we try to bring it all into balance with the acidity and the mid-palate through the oak treatment. So uh, I think it's kind of interesting to taste all the wines here from literally the same hillside at the, at the vineyard, see how different they can be, all the decisions that go into you know growing the grapes to start and keeping in mind what we want from that uh, finished product. But there are some of the red wines that we do best here and obviously kind of the, the variation that you can have. So thank you guys for joining me. I hope you enjoyed it. Please uh, continue to check our social media and our website. We are open. We look forward to having you out here and uh, we can't wait to see you soon.